Good morning for another edition of Faith in KC. I'm Taylor Hemnes from KSHB 41. Glad to have you with us on this cold Friday morning as I record this in Kansas City. Uh, really excited about this new episode today. I know I say that every time and every month we bring you a new episode, uh, but hopefully it's already clear to you uh, as to why I'm excited. You may notice um, the interpreter in the corner of the screen. That is my friend Juliana interpreting for me today because today's episode uh, involves a pastor from a deaf church. His name is Pastor Mark Truitt. He is the pastor at Deaf Liberty Baptist Church in Overland Park. This was a, an eye-opening conversation for me. Um, and it was an awareness kind of thing for me to, to look around and go, okay, I, I knew that, but I'd never thought of it that way before. And I hope it's the same way for you. Um, it, it really made me think of, and you'll see one of the questions there, Hearing about the experiences inside a deaf church made me wonder what my own personal faith would be like if all of a sudden I were not able to understand the preacher or the person leading singing or anyone on stage at my church because we quite literally communicate in a different way. We'll talk about this in the episode, but obviously faith is an, an intensely personal thing until it's not, until it's a community. And he talks about the idea of community quite a bit, and I really enjoyed what he had to say. Um, a programming note, if you will. Um, Patrick Truitt, because these are done over Zoom, is going to be interpreting for himself when he speaks in sign, uh, but also for me when I ask questions. So for our viewers who are non-hearing, uh, please bear with us, especially as there's maybe some delays here and there in that because he's pulling double duty but I really appreciate his effort, and I hope that it uh, translates over this Zoom screen. As always, thank you so much for watching. You can find me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Uh, send me your thoughts and questions and suggestions as to who I can speak to next. Um, you can email me at taylor.hymnus at kshb.com. Uh, I always love to interact with people and hear more about what they think after watching these episodes. But for now, uh, enjoy this next episode, and thank you for watching. So good morning, welcome to Faith in KC. I'm glad to be joined by Pastor Mark Truitt of the Deaf Liberty Baptist Church in Overland Park, as I mentioned here. Uh, as I mentioned in the intro, it's gonna be a little bit of a different Faith in KC, and I'm excited about that today. Mark, thank you for joining me. You're welcome. Thank you for the opportunity to be here, Taylor. Tell me why there's a need for a deaf church compared to a person being able to go to a church that has an interpreter in place. Why a need for a congregation solely for the non-hearing community? Um, that's a that's a great uh, opening question, Taylor. It really is. Um, I've thought a lot about this. I've um, it, there's really two different approaches to this question. There's uh, the deaf education, deaf world approach, and then there's um, perhaps a, a biblical approach. Um, and I try my best to approach this uh, from, from both ways. So uh, I grew up in what we, we in the deaf world, we call the hearing world. Um, I, I grew up with a hearing family. I had uh, no real experience with the deaf until we had a few deaf people start coming to our church. Um, when that happened, my parents were actually a part of starting a deaf ministry with uh, a few deaf people who were coming to our church at that time. Um, that was my first exposure to the deaf world, and that was an opportunity for me to see people who are different. Um, in churches and in the world right now, especially, uh, diversity is a big topic and, and a big emphasis, and it should be. Um, we should want more diversity. We should want more uh, voices to be heard. We should want more stories to be told. Um, and so when we talk about diversity, we say, okay, well, why not have only have, you know, hearing churches and then have interpreters for the deaf? Uh, the best answer for that uh, that I can that I've come up with that I've landed on is if, if you were to let's say move to another country 
to begin to work with another people group in another country? Would you take the time to learn their language and communicate to them in their first language? Or would you rather only work through an interpreter or a translator all the time? Um, we know that people go to other countries and they talk with other people and they mostly work through an interpreter or a translator. But if you were gonna live there, if you're going to operate there, if you were going to start some kind of ministry there, I, I would hope and most people would encourage you to learn their language so that you can communicate in their first language rather than working through a second language or working through an interpreter or a translator all the time, which is one of the big reasons why deaf are drawn to a church that provides um, a message of hope. Um, a message of um, connectivity, a message of unity in their first language rather than through a second language. Um, I just think it's really interesting, mostly from people who are hearing, who can speak, expect other people to join their ministry and say, oh, come and hear from what I'm saying when there are people who are able to communicate in the first language to these people who have the opportunity to share God's message to these people in their first language, in the language that they know the best. It's interesting because uh, faith and religion is obviously an intensely personal thing. How important is it in your mind to be able to hear someone else talk about faith or religion in your in your case you're preaching to a deaf congregation what is the importance of being able to hear someone else talk about faith as opposed to just spending time in my own bible religion faith whatever that may be in, in, a, in a personal setting just me where do you come into the, the equation, I guess, is the question. Um, it's, a, it's a great question. Um, again, I think really the question is, why do we have to get together? Um, is there a need to get together? Um, like you said, why can't I myself stay at home, study whatever scripture that I believe in, in, in my case, the Bible, why can't I stay home, read the Bible, study for myself, grow, pray, um, spend time with God, um, meditate on the word of God? Why, why do I need to go to a church? Um, and, and I think maybe you're setting yourself up to ask the next question, and I'll, I'll let you do that because I can see where this could lead, and I'll leave that alone for now. If we don't get there, I'll answer it later. Um, why is it important to go to church? I think uh, a really key word is community. And the deaf world knows this more than anyone. Um, you are hearing, Taylor, uh, you can go almost anywhere in the Kansas City area and have a conversation with anyone. Um, you can go to a restaurant, you can talk with your waitress, uh, you can go to uh, the bowling alley and talk with the person next to you. Uh, you can go to a Kansas City Chiefs game, you can talk with the people who are sitting around you and you have the opportunity to have community with the people who are around you. In the deaf world, it's very different because uh, a deaf person who goes to the Kansas City Chiefs game, they're not able to communicate with the people who are sitting around them. They're not able to communicate with a waitress except for writing back and forth on a piece of paper and how deep of a conversation can you have in that way? You can't. Um, they're not able to go to the bowling alley and talk with the person next to them. So having a sense of community is so important, especially for the deaf community. Um, it's one of the reasons why our church has been so steadfast. Um, our church was established in 1980. 
Uh, I wasn't even born yet. Um, <laughs> uh, it was established in 1980. It moved around some, but we're now in our location. We've been there for over 23 years now, and we now own that property. It's paid off. We own it 100%, and it's one of the few in the nation, one of the few in the world, uh, deaf-owned churches that are only used for the deaf community to come and share the message of Jesus Christ in a deaf community way, um, which just really ties people to the ministry. If you're not familiar with Faith in KC, if this is your first episode to watch, um, we profile lots of different religions and faiths and different people. Uh, I am a member of a faith community. I was raised Christian, which Mark and I spoke about before uh, we started this interview. And uh, also, if you're not familiar, I don't necessarily write down any questions. I want this to be a conversation. So I'm interested, Mark, that you said the next question, because I didn't have a specific one. But the reason I asked the first one is just from your first answer, it made me think about what my own church experience would be like with a personal faith already ingrained if all of a sudden I couldn't understand the preacher or the person leading singing or the person praying from the stage. My faith itself is not changed, but the people who I'm sharing it with in a church setting are no longer speaking the same language as me. And it I'd never thought of that that way until you described the community aspect. That was that was what occurred to me as you said that. And I I wondered about how you would interpret the need for someone else in a church setting. Yeah. For me, I, I think the conversation then leads to COVID. Right, because right now COVID is is the topic. Um, you can't turn on your TV without seeing something about uh, COVID. And so during COVID, now um, because of you know state requirements and those things, there was a lot of pressure, especially at the beginning, a lot of pressure on churches um, to close their doors and offer only online streaming. Um, and for me, it really put me in a hard place um, because I believe personally, I believe in following um, the governing law as best that I can. Um, I, I, you know, at, at some point, I think it would be appropriate to say, I'd rather follow God than man, but most of the time I really try hard to not uh, to to not go against what the governing body of our state and, and our government in America has laid out, and so that really put me in a tough spot uh, because I know that the deaf community needs community. Um, I know that the deaf community needs to come together. Um, I believe that the hearing community does too. Um, I would say that. I, I don't believe that listening to the preacher online is church. I personally don't believe that. I don't call that church. I call it watching a sermon. Um, I call it maybe participating in some kind of service, but I wouldn't call that church. Um, and the reason is, is because of my definition of the word church. Uh, my definition of the word church is a, a called out group of believers who gather together for the purpose of worshiping and for sharing the faith of Jesus Christ with others. That's really hard to do when you're not together. Um, in fact, I would say that it's, it's maybe impossible. Um, and so what do you do? Right. What do you do um, in the very beginning of 2020, uh, the state of Kansas, where our church is, 
um, the governor made, you know, the announcement that limited only to, to 10 people could come to church. Now, our community is not a huge community. Our church is typically between 30 to 40 people on a Sunday. We can get more, 50 or 60, but um, in my time there, we've only had more than that just a couple of times for, for big events. Um, so our church is pretty good size. Um, our auditorium could fit, you know, pre-COVID, <laughs> uh, according to the fire you know, department, we can fit 190 people in our auditorium. But that's like standing, you know, next to each other. So I could easily fit, you know, 30, 40 people in my auditorium and still follow, you know, the CDC guidelines. So it put me in a hard place. I, I don't want to not obey the government, but at the same time, I know my people need to get together. And so we got creative. <laughs> we met in the parking lot um, and I, I preached from from the front porch. And the people sat in their cars and we talked. And the great thing about sign language is we can communicate through, you know, the window. We don't have to talk. We can sign. So it was really cool. We had the opportunity to meet. We had the opportunity to have that community. We, uh, we even had the opportunity to uh, take the Lord's Supper together. Um, we just got really creative with how we were going to do this and still um, follow the government guidelines uh, that were set up. Yeah, I was I was definitely going to ask you about that. Uh, we started this series at kind of the height of COVID in 2020, pre-vaccine, as a way to ask people about how this world-changing, life-changing pandemic might be effect affecting them from a faith standpoint. Um, and obviously, churches being affected too, not just individuals. So that's I, that's interesting. I was definitely going to ask you about that. Was there ever a day or maybe bad weather that you guys thought, oh, what are we going to do this this morning? It's 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 98 degrees outside or it's snowing or I, I don't know the parking lot's going to work. Uh, you know, it's funny that you asked that. <laughs> we had great weather. <laughs> uh, we always were looking, you know, we were nervous you know we were praying uh oh, you know what's it gonna look like but we met uh faithfully uh for several weeks uh through the months of march and uh up until easter sunday uh, i think is when some of those uh guidelines were uh lifted and we were able to come back inside and meet together as long as we followed those you know six feet uh distances and things like that so I think we met outside for maybe about a month um, and we had great weather. Uh, there were a few days where it was windy and, and I had to put rocks on, on top of my Bible. Uh, we didn't have, uh, we even carted uh, one of the TV screens outside so we, I could use that for, uh, I use, you know, PowerPoint or whatever for my messages. We carted a TV screen out and uh, we just got really creative and, and we took some risks. Yeah. Um, but really saw blessings uh, of being faithful, um, I believe, uh, to the Lord in, in doing what he called us to do. And, and that is including getting together. That, that's interesting to say that. Um, again, a reminder that Mark is trying to uh, interpret for me and for him at the same time. So we appreciate your, your patience with both of us. Um, obviously, there's a strong difference about your congregation than every other church I've spoken to for this series. So some questions are going to be very clearly different. Some I want to be the same. One is I've asked every other faith leader about how they have seen people's faiths affected by the pandemic, whether that be a weakening of a faith for some people, a strengthening of a faith for some people, a reawakening. What have you seen in in people you are around on a regular basis at your church, um, faith wise, from impact of the pandemic? Yeah, good question. Uh, again, um, 
it's interesting because I, I talk with people too. Um, I have the opportunity to talk with some other church leaders and um, other uh, deaf ministries and deaf churches around the nation. And a, a large percentage, I would say um, maybe 90, 95% of the people that I speak with have seen a decrease in church attendance uh, post COVID. Um, they've seen a decrease in their tithes and offerings. They've seen a decrease in um, passion uh, from people and, and their commitment. Um, it, those conversations are really hard for me because I've, I've seen the opposite of that from, for, for my ministry and my church. Um, I, our people have been faithful. Um, you have to understand there are some people in my congregation who were there the first day in 1980. Uh, my assistant pastor, his name is Teddy Chang. Uh, he was a young man uh, from Gallaudet University who was here in the Kansas City area. And he was part of one of the first three men who got together and said, we're going to start a church. Um, and they called the first pastor, David Hansen, um, who was also a deaf man, um, had gone to Gallaudet University. And they they started a church uh, January 20th, 1980. We just celebrated our 42nd anniversary. Um, and they started a church here in, in the greater Kansas City area. Teddy Chang is, is still there. <laughs> you know, 42 years later, uh, he's still a, a faithful member of our church. So I have really, really, really strong faith believers in my congregation. Um, they've been through a lot. And not just life, but also as deaf people, they've been through a lot. Um, when you talk about under uh, privileged people groups, um, there's a lot of focus that's uh, put on urban areas or uh, the black community or the LGBTQ community. There's a lot of emphasis and focus on that in the world today. Um, uh, POC community, all of these things are, are emphasized. Underemphasized is the deaf community. Um, because the deaf community experiences oppression in many ways. Um, and, and I could talk about that. It's probably a, a whole conversation for a whole nother day because it's really not faith related. Um, it's, it's more of a deaf world problem, uh, a deaf social issue. Um, but it does impact many people in their faith because they see hearing people and what hearing people do, and they see the oppression that they've been through, and the people who have oppressed them many times are Christians. Um, and so because of that, there is a disconnect for many in the deaf community between what you're saying and what you're doing. Um, and so because of that, there is a large part of the deaf community who feels distanced um, from a community of faith believers. They also see people fail. Um, I know I don't have to tell you, uh, but there, it, it seems like, you know, every few years you see another big named pastor who falls, um, because of sin, because of, of something that they do wrong. Um, and again, that impacts, uh, the efficacy of, you know, the ministry. So because of that, our church has been through many of those things. And the people who are there now are just really strong. Um, and they have the ability to weather uh, the, uh, this difficult time. And I'm thankful for the people in our congregation. I really am because uh, they've just really been faithful. They've been supportive. Um, our, our tithes, our offerings have not dropped. Um, we've actually done very well uh, during this COVID time. So we're thankful for that. At the same time, we understand that many churches are facing a hard time. And, and we are sensitive 
uh, to that, and we want them to do well again. I would encourage people that right now is is the perfect time uh, to begin to look to the Lord because it's the perfect time for faith, really, uh, especially right now uh, when, you know, people are wondering what's going on. You know, why uh, why are we still in this? Uh, we know we, we thought this was going to be over um, and, and it's not. And it probably never will be. Um, so what do we do now? Um, and I think it's really a perfect time uh, to look to the Lord as um, as a as as a, a place of trust. Um, there's a lot of uh, if if I can use the word fake news, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, from everywhere, from everywhere. Um, and there's one place that I know that I feel comfortable placing my faith um, that I, I know has never, uh, you know, let me down, has never uh, caused me to experience struggles. And that place is the word of God and, and in God himself. I'm embarrassed to say that if I were to think of groups of people who are oppressed, the deaf community is not one of the first that I consider. So for you to say that is eye-opening for me. <clears throat> you, you mentioned the correlation between a person feeling that way and their faith. Do you, do you feel that amongst your congregation as far as a, a need for refuge? for relief from some of that, from people who are who are coming to church and are also deaf? Uh, I, I think so, yes. Um, it, it's also hard uh, um, because I myself am hearing. Um, <laughs> so that's hard. Um, to as as a person who has never experienced some of the oppression that they have experienced, um, I myself am not deaf, um, and so I have never experienced the oppression that they have experienced. At the same time, I know somebody who did, um, and I and I call that man Jesus. Um, he, he went through a lot. He was oppressed. And, and I talk about this often with my people, um, there are people come to me and they say, Oh, Mark, you know, this happened and they're complaining. I said, I understand. Can, can we look at a, a book I have? And in my office, I have a book and th this book is, is a picture book. Um, and there are pictures or, or screenshots from the movie, The Passion. Um, and so I, I show them pictures <laughs> from that book. And I say, did you experience this? Okay, did you experience this? No, N not yet. You haven't reached that, that level of oppression yet. Okay, I know it's hard, but if he can get through this, you can get through this. Um, and, and it's an opportunity to kind of um, put your oppression in perspective and understand that with God's help, we can come through oppressive times. We can go through oppressive situations and still uh, bring glory and honor to the, the most important one, uh, the Lord God. So, and I, and I learned that from my father-in-law. Um, so uh, my father-in-law is actually a deaf man. Uh, my wife's parents are, are both deaf. And so while I myself am not deaf, I have a really strong connection with the deaf community. Um, and, and that really was one of the things that drew me into um, deaf ministry and, and drew me into working with the deaf was my relationship uh, with my wife and, and her family, her parents. Um, when I first got to college, I, uh, I went to Trinity Baptist College in Jacksonville, Florida. And uh, when I got there, they wanted us to be involved in a ministry. 
And so I looked around and, and I was working full time, Taylor. <laughs> I was working for public uh, supermarkets and uh, trying to pay my way through college. I was a, a poor college student. I'm, I'm looking for the easiest thing to do. <laughs> And uh, and so I knew a little bit of sign language because my parents had, had worked with the deaf. So I knew a little bit of sign language. I said, I'm going to go work with the deaf. It'll be easy. Um, and and I just I fell in love with it um, and really uh, connected uh, with the deaf community there at that church and really connected with deaf people there, uh, made some really good uh, friendships there. And that really impacted my life. And uh, one of those people was my father-in-law. And uh, as I began to build a relationship with him, I got to know his daughter. And, and, and the rest, you could say, is history. We were celebrated uh, just recently, January 19th, our 15th uh, wedding anniversary. So uh, it's just, it's cool how my connection to the deaf community happened. Um, but yeah, it, it is hard. Um, I, I do think that our church is a place of refuge uh, for people, especially deaf people who are oppressed. Um, there are some in our community who are thrice oppressed. Uh, they're deaf, they're black, and they're a woman. And it's like, man, it, the, the difficulty that these people have been through. And, and I sit and I talk with some of these people, and, and, and it's like, man, the stories that, that they tell me, the things that they've seen, the things that they've experienced. Um, and, and yet <laughs> I draw us back to, to the picture of Jesus Christ, um, and what he went through. And I encourage these people. Yes, you went through hard things. Um, but you can go through these things and still bring honor and glory to God. I'm curious about, because obviously people inside of a faith community, uh, often take the opportunity to visit other congregations and see what other faith experiences are like, consist of, maybe even within their own tradition, but with slight differences. Um, as a hearing person, if I were to visit your congregation, what would my experience look like? What does, what does a church service look and, if I may ask, sound like uh, inside your church? Uh, well, <laughs> great question. Uh, many times, and we have, uh, oftentimes, we'll have hearing people visit our church. Uh, many times they're um, training to become interpreters or uh, they are, you know, in some kind of sign language class and, and they're curious about what a, a faith community would look like in the deaf world. And they will. They'll come and visit us often. Um, and, and, and we welcome all people, all languages. Um, we currently, we only offer uh, interpretation into English. Um, that's the only language that we offer interpretation to, but you're welcome. If you speak another language, you're welcome. You, you may not understand everything, um, but we would encourage people to come. Um, so we do, we, we offer um, what we call voice interpreting. Um, I do not use my voice when I preach. I turn my voice off. Um, and the reason is because then I can focus completely on the signs, um, on the language of my target audience, as you could say. Um, my goal is to reach the deaf people who are a part of my congregation and my community. Um, so um, I'm not the only one who gets up on the platform. There are others. We do have music. Uh, typically loud music too, um, with, with a pretty heavy beat. Uh, the deaf people enjoy that. They enjoy feeling the, the music. Um, and so the bass gets cranked. We have a, a pretty big uh, subwoofer uh, that, that, that gives us a beat. And we, um, we want to worship, uh, much like hearing people want to worship. Um, so when I preach, again, I, I preach fully in sign language, but we do have voice interpreters. We have several who um, work with uh, voice interpreting on Sundays and on Wednesdays. So a person who's hearing who would come and visit our church would experience um, church in a way 
that you asked me the very first question you asked me, why not? Why not deaf people go to a hearing church and, and see an interpreter and that'd be fine? I would actually flip that question and ask hearing people, why don't they come to the deaf church? If it's the same, why not come and be a part? Now, interestingly enough, we have a few people in our church that are that way. Um, there's a, a one couple in our church who's been there for over 20 years. Um, the wife is one of my voice interpreters, but the husband does not sign very much. He knows some, uh, we call survival signs. You know, he knows some signs, but he doesn't sign very much. But he is 100% content with coming to a deaf church and being a part of the community. And he's, he's involved. Um, and he uses his, his gifts um, for the Lord in, in his way. And there are some people who are that way. But it's rare because people want the message in their first language. And I think that's, it's, it's always the hearing people who say, well, why don't the deaf come here? It's never the opposite. It's never, oh, hearing people, I want to go to the deaf church. I'm going to join the deaf church. You would never say that because you want it in your first language, the same way as the deaf community. But but we welcome. We welcome all people. <laughs> it's funny. Uh, one time we had a, a young couple who came in, and they were both hearing. And I thought, oh, maybe one of them's in a deaf program or something. I, they came in a little bit late, so I didn't get a chance to talk to them before the service. After the service, I went up to talk to them and said, you know, what brings you in here today? Uh, oh, we, we didn't know it was a deaf church. And, you know, we have a sign outside that says Deaf Liberty Baptist Church. Um, and uh, I said, oh, you know, he said, oh, I thought it, it was maybe a different word. But I thought it was maybe somebody's name. I thought maybe it was a different denomination or something. <laughs> and so it's always funny when that happens. But it does happen. <laughs> Mark, you've been awesome, and I could. This has been so interesting for me, and I could spend all day talking to you. Um, but I won't take more of your time. There is one more question I wanted to ask you about: the idea of um, missionary work on a local level. Um, as I mentioned and have mentioned before, I'm a person of faith. My faith tradition tells me to go into all the world and share the gospel. I've only ever lived someplace that I speak the same language as everyone else. And I will be the first to admit that my sharing the gospel is likely not the level that it should be. Tell me about that aspect of faith when it comes to a deaf person being able to share their faith with someone else when they're not able to communicate the way they'd like to. It's one of the greatest challenges, um, I think. Again, I, I can't answer that question maybe the best um, because I myself am not deaf. Uh, but I have spoken with a lot of deaf people. Um, one of my mentors, um, his, his name is David Bennett. Um, he was a missionary in Brazil, uh, Sao Paulo, Brazil, for over 20 years as a missionary to the deaf and the hearing uh, communities there in Sao Paulo, Brazil. His church that he established is still there. Um, and now he is um, the head of a mission board uh, called Silent Word Ministries International. And his mission board, his goal is to reach the deaf around the world. And I, I've spoken with him a lot about this. Uh, how do deaf people share the message of, of God's story um, in their life? Uh, Jesus Christ, how, how has that made an impact in your life? Um, what about uh, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ? What difference does that make for you in your life? Um, and it's one of the greatest challenges for a deaf person. Um, I think probably the best answer is for more deaf people 
to write their experiences. Um, it, 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 do you know what a tract is? One of these little paper things that you can hand to people. And, and sometimes yes. you'll see uh, some people hand out these little paper things and it, yes. and it usually has some kind of pull to it. I think if more deaf people would write about their life and then, and, and we've talked with it. I've, some of my guys in my church, I've talked with them and I've encouraged them to write their experiences. Um, I, I joke one, one of my guys, his name is Bill. And, and when he got saved at that time, he was really, he had lost his farm. Um, and, and so I teased him. I said, the name of the little thing that you should write is a uh, old deaf farmer lost his farm. E I E O no. And he just laughed and laughed and laughed. Uh, but that led to his understanding that everything that he had put his faith in, this farm that he thought was going to make him wealthy, that he thought was going to change his life, and now it's gone. Um, he realized that that would, um, that's going to cause him to look for other things that would provide him satisfaction, other things that would provide him hope. And, and that led to him understanding Jesus Christ, the Bible, uh, the word of God, and a relationship with God um, that met that satisfaction. And so if more deaf people shared their stories, I think that would help. Um, because, again, as a, a people group um, stuck if you will, in a society that no one understands them. How do they communicate? It's difficult. It's difficult. Um, I encourage my people to invite hearing people to our church all the time because my, my deaf people work. Um, they, they, one of my guys works up in Leavenworth. Uh, he works on, on the Army base there. Uh, one of my deaf ladies works at a gym. I have several people who work in, in just – opportunities of places where they can share Jesus Christ. So number one, your testimony, you work hard, uh, you be different than other people. And I'll notice, they'll say, wow, this deaf person works hard. I wonder why. Um, and, and that may lead to a conversation. Uh, number one, number two, share it, write a verse on a piece of paper and hand it to them. Do something. And I, I agree with you. I think that we should talk about our faith, uh, even if we can't talk. I, I think it's important that we share um, what we believe in. Is it challenging? Yeah, it is. Is it difficult? Yeah, it is. Uh, but it's not an excuse. Uh, I, I think it's an opportunity rather uh, than an excuse. It's an opportunity to even be more impactful. Um, so I, I really. I agree with you. It's a challenge, but it's not an impossibility. Mark, I am so appreciative of your time, your skill, your effort this morning with me in having this conversation. Uh, I, I believe I know how to say thank you. Go ahead. I, sign it again. I, this is thank you, right? Okay. Thank you. Perfect. Now, but how, if you could, could you show me how to say God bless you in, in sign language? Sure. So God, God here, bless with both hands, bless, bless. one up here and one a little bit lower. Bless, like bless, bless uh -huh. you, you. I mean, that, let's see Mark, it. I, okay, so let's, let's see it. Again. So I, this is, this is thank you. And then Perfect. God is here. God is here. And then bless you. Perfect. You That's, did great. I, 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 well, I, I know I didn't do great. And also over Zoom, I'm sure it leaves some extra as well. But uh, truly, thank you, Mark, for, for joining us and sharing this message. I, I really, really appreciate it. Thank you, too, for the opportunity to be here. And, and I know we are not the only deaf ministry in, in the greater Kansas City area. Um, I, I would encourage people to, to look around. Um, I know your own ministry offers interpreters and things like that. And, and it's not... I am not against churches who provide interpreter services at all. Um, I, I want that to be emphasized. I believe that in, in many churches 
um, do well with their deaf ministries. And, and I think it can be done very well. Um, I know Countryside Church uh, down South Oakland Park has a very good deaf ministry. I know West Side Family Church. Um, my good buddy, uh, Kevin, is there. Um, encourage people to check him out, too. I, I told him I would shout him out today. Uh, and so, um, yeah, there, there are other communities, faith communities, um, good deaf faith communities. Uh, Lenexa Baptist Church is now starting uh, a deaf ministry. And so there are other communities out there. But I encourage people also to come and experience a, a truly immersive uh, deaf experience um, because it is challenging to your worldview. Uh, if, if only you know hearing church and you've never experienced another community's church. Um, I remember the first time I, I went to an all black church. Um, it was it was culture shock. I was interpreting for a funeral uh, for one of the ladies in our deaf churches. Uh, her aunt or something had passed away. And it, the only two white guys in the room was myself and our deaf pastor at that time uh, in Jacksonville. And uh, you talk about culture shock. It was just a different experience. But wow, what a great experience I had because I was there. And I encourage other people to experience, like you said, different cultural faith experiences. I think it's important and I think it's valuable. Um, and I would encourage people to come and check us out. We are online, we're on YouTube, uh, but it's not the same as being in person. 